Hello, welcome to a bonus episode of the New Scientist podcast. I'm Rowan Hooper. Now, I wanted to do a special show today because some big news has just broken, suggesting the detection of life on another planet. Uh, We're going to hear from some astronomers in a minute, but the top line for this story is about the purported discovery of a molecule called DMS, which on Earth is only produced by plankton, Uh, and which may have turned up in the atmosphere of a planet called K218b, which is about 120 light years away. Alex Wilkins is here to discuss this with me. Alex, I want to start with a few headlines about this that have come in overnight. Here's The Sun, uh, a UK newspaper. ET phones home. Best ever sign of aliens found as scientists say they're 99.7% sure and believe planet could be teeming with life. Yeah, uh, the BBC have gone with something slightly more serious. Scientists find promising hints of life on distant planets. Yeah, serious, but still very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, The New York Times, astronomers detect a possible signature of life on a distant planet. Also pretty strong. And your story in New Scientist, Alex? Yep, so we went for astronomers claim strongest evidence of alien life yet. Okay. All right, so look, that's the media response, which is pretty strong. Uh, here's Niku Madhusudan. Uh, he's the astronomer at the University of Cambridge who's led this work. Here's what he had to say. These are the first hints we are seeing of an alien world that is possibly inhabited. And this is a revolutionary moment, fundamentally to me as an astronomer, but also to our species, that we have been able to come from single cellular life billions of years ago to an advanced technological civilization, which is able to peer through the atmosphere of another planet and actually find evidence for possible biological activity. Very, it's all very exciting, isn't it? Life on another planet, it's very easy to get carried away. Our job is to pour cold water all over this, Alex. Um, So let's set it up first. First, let's talk about the telescope that's been used to to make this dis- detection. Yep, so we are using the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's been in operation since 2021. We got the first images, these amazing images of the night yeah. sky, these stars in 2022. But what's really exciting about this telescope isn't just the pictures it can take, it's the spectroscopy it can do. Yeah, so that that has a, is there's an instrument that um, it can measure the light. As the planet passes uh, in front of its star, the light goes through the this thin atmosphere and the, this instrument can measure what's in the atmosphere of of the planet, right? Exactly, exactly. So this whole kind of story starts about a year and a half ago. So Niku Madhusudan at Cambridge and his colleagues, they used the James Webb to look at this exoplanet K218b, uh, and they they looked at it in near-infrared light, and they found evidence of water vapour, they found carbon dioxide, they found methane, but most excitingly, and kind of it was tantalising at the time, they found evidence of this compound dimethyl sulfide, or DMS as as it's referred Mm. to. Now, on Earth, DMS is uniquely produced by life, mainly from marine phytoplankton. Um, The signs for DMS were extremely weak in this first detection, so other astronomers looked at it and said, well, this could be anything. It could just be noise in the data, basically. So it was exciting, but no one was really getting their hopes up for what this might mean, Mm. and, and we really needed to follow up observations. Now, Madhu Sudan and his colleagues have done those observations. Uh, they've used a different instrument on James Webb, looking at a different part of the light frequency uh, than the first observations. And now they've found a much stronger signal for DMS, uh, as well as a possible related molecule called dimethyl sulfide, DMDS, um, which is also only produced on Earth by life. And it's all going quite quickly, isn't it? Because this planet, K218b, was only discovered in 2015. What do we know about the planet? Yeah, so, I mean, this whole thing is super fast. T- to put it in context, we only found our first exoplanet in the 90s. So yeah. within 20 years, we've gone from not even knowing there were exoplanets to now being able to look at an atmosphere. Incredible. So it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so what we know about this planet is it's a possible super Earth. It's about eight times the mass of our own Earth, about two and a half times wider the radius. And it's about 124 light years away, orbiting this red dwarf star quite closely, much closer than we orbit our own sun. And excitingly, it's in the habitable zone of its star, which means that it's in this region where temperatures might be right for liquid water to exist. And that that led to suggestions uh, in these kind of first observations that the planet might be an ocean world where it has these uh, large oceans under a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, although that's kind of been debated as well. Okay, but, but anything in the habitable zone immediately gets people excited before you even start looking at the contents of the atmosphere. But let's hear a bit more from Madhusudan uh, about this result. This is a very 
fundamental advancement in our search for life. And we here are very careful in making sure that we make absolutely the most robust statement we can given the current results. It is super exciting, but we also want to be very measured in how we communicate this to society, both from a scientific point of view, but from the journalistic point of view as well. This is the kind of result where all of us have a responsibility to make sure that this lands on uh, society in a very robust manner uh, and reflecting uh, the truth accurately as I'm going to present uh, shortly. So this is the first time humanity, our species, has ever seen the spectrum of a habitable zone exoplanet in the mid-infrared. Okay, that's number one. And number two, this is the first time humanity has ever seen biosignature molecules, potential biosignature molecules, which are biosignatures on Earth, in the atmosphere of a habitable zone planet. What we are finding is an independent line of evidence in a different wavelength range with a different instrument of possible biological activity on the planet. Okay, well, look, he said he wants to make this land robustly in society. I think it, it's landed a bit, probably a bit harder um, certainly, I think the public will have taken away that there is much stronger evidence for life on another planet than there really is. So what sort of response have you had reporting this? So I've spoken to quite a few astronomers. I think it's telling that not one of those astronomers came out and said, we found life or this is kind of this is the moment. Some of them were quite a lot more skeptical than that. So I'll read out kind of at one end, like the most skeptical. Mm. One astronomer told me, we have a boy who cried wolf situation for K218b where multiple previous three sigma detections have completely vanished when subject to closer scrutiny. Okay, so three sigma detection. Let's talk about that because um, the team claim it's three sigma. That's, uh, that's what scientists use when they're assessing the, the statistical likelihood of a, of a real detection of something or not, uh, which means it's got a, a three sigma means 99.7% chance uh, that the, the detection is correct. And that's why the Sun, in their headline, were able to write 99.7% sure. But what people will obviously think, oh, they're 99.7% sure there's aliens there. But that's not what it is. It's about whether there's DMS in the atmosphere. Um, but there's even doubts about whether it's even three sigma, right? Yeah, the, it's a controversial um, statement. And, and this three sigma thing is really important to understand. So as you said, they're 99.7% sure that DMS is what's what they're looking at from the data. But the data analysis is really complicated from James Webb. So you get all of this noisy data and it kind of depends on how you and your team of researchers analyze that data and get a result out of it. A another way of looking at three sigma is that there's a three in a thousand chance that this data we're looking at is just a fluke, like it's a statistical anomaly. And really the gold standard for saying we've made a detection is five sigma, which is much more like above 99.9 percent .9%, that's more like a 3.5 in a million chance that this is a statistical fluke and it's what scientists are really looking for when they want to say we've made a detection yeah but just to bring home the the real technical achievement they've made here there was a line in your reporting uh, that said the relative size of the atmosphere compared to the size of the planet is basically the same as the, the thickness of an apple skin on top of an apple but you're measuring that <laughs> the light going through that apple skin from 120 light years away. And as you say, we've only really just started to be able to confirm these exoplanets at all, and now we're doing this. I mean, regardless of what comes out of this, the, the measurement they've made is mind-boggling. It's, it's really incredible what they can do. In terms of getting to five sigma, whether that's possible, a few astronomers said that it's it's not really clear whether we can ever get to that with the how noisy this data is, as you say, how hard this calculation measurement is. Um, it's not clear whether we'll ever get to that. Uh, Madhu Sudan and his colleagues think that if they have another kind of 16 to 24 hours observation time, they might get to that five sigma level, but it's not a kind of shortcut deal. Mm. Well, they haven't had that much observation time on it. And th probably with this, they, they'll be able to get some more when they squeeze some more time out of the instrument. I'm sure they can make the argument for um, that. So that's one thing, though. L let's say that even if we did get to five sigma and we said for sure there's DMS in the atmosphere. That, that doesn't mean that there's definitely life there. I spoke to Laura Kreidberg. She's the managing director of the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. Uh, here she is on this. 
So yeah, my take on this is that this is in the category of interesting if true. But at this point, I'm still really not convinced that what we're seeing is a biosignature. I think that the discovery team did a great job, really careful work with the data. But as someone in this business myself, I can say that it is just really hard. The potential detection of the biosignature gas DMS is coming from small changes in the planet's size as a function of wavelength. So what we're talking about is a signal from the, the planet that is smaller than a tenth of a percent. So really, really pushing the limit of what JWST can do. I like how she said uh, it's interesting if true. It's not mm. like I, at first I would be saying it's huge if true. But no, actually, it's still only interesting if true. And that's because DMS might not be a biosignature. And here, here she is again. One of the things I'm concerned about is unknown unknowns. Everything from the specific behavior of the detector that was used to collect the photons from the planet uh, to which molecules were included in the modeling of the atmosphere. Uh, the discovery team looked at about 20 different molecules, and that's already a big effort and a great start. But it's not comprehensive. That does not include every possible molecule that could be responsible for what we're seeing. And even if the DMS is really there, I'm not convinced that that by itself is a biosignature. One of the questions I have is whether this molecule could also be produced by photochemistry in the planet's atmosphere. We're seeing that this is important for, for other planets. Uh, so basically, we're, we're far from a slam dunk. Something like a biosignature is an extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence and in, in my humble opinion, this ain't that. Okay, so it's not a slam dunk biosignature by any means. And I also saw that uh, the comet, uh, last year scientists measured um, dust from the comet 67P, the Cherimov-Gerasimenko comet. That's the one the Rosetta probe was measuring. They found DMS on that comet. Uh, and that's a dead, that's definitely dead. Um, so there is a potential abiotic um, product, a source for, for DMS. Um, so, you know, as she says, we we don't know, we can't say for sure that DMS is a biosignature, even if we th it's only produced by plankton on Earth. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the whole chemistry of DMS, we understand it on Earth, but how it might exist in other exoplanets, we don't know at all. Interestingly, on that comet point, the uh, Madhu Sudan was asked about that in the press conference. And he said, yes, it was found on this comet, but it was in very, very small amounts. And they actually managed to estimate how much DMS might be on K218b. And they found it was over 10 parts per million. To put that in context, that is thousands of times greater than the concentration found on Earth, um, which could signal a far greater amount of biological activity on Earth. It also means that whatever process was producing it on that comet, it might have to be very different to produce that much on the planet. So th there are still some kind of points of optimism. And and to, I realize we've been kind of pouring a lot of cold water on this, mm -hmm. but to, to give a bit of optimism, one of I spoke to said that ignoring whether or not it actually is produced by life, it's something that a decade ago, astronomers and astrobiologists said would be evidence for life in the atmosphere of a planet that could feasibly host it. And that in and of itself would be a tremendous advance. So th that's worth bearing in mind here. Yeah, I think the, the funny thing about this whole story is I think there's quite likely to be life all over the place actually, maybe even on Mars um, and certainly on some exoplanets that are in nice places around their stars. So there is likely to be life everywhere. We think it might have evolved quite easily, actually, on Earth. Um, but, but detecting it and saying for sure we found it, that's, that's what we're talking about here. And that's, that's where the problem is. And, you know, as we've said, we might end up saying for sure that there's DMS there and then we'll on the, we're on the next problem, which is, well, is that, does that mean it's biological or not? So, yeah, it's going to be hard from 120 light years away to say that there's life on another planet. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I was doing a kind of back of the envelope calculation to see whether we might ever be able to get there. 120 light years it might be difficult to conceive of how far away that is. So our best hope for a fast moving spaceship is this breakthrough Starshot project involving these ultra thin light sails with unbelievably powerful lasers that don't exist yet. Uh, and by all accounts, it's a project that's probably decades off. Yeah. 
if that somehow we manage to pull that off and we can get to within uh, 20% of the speed of light and, and we can really kind of send these super fast light sails, even with that, it would take around 600 years to get there. <laughs> so we, we, need wor- we need a wormhole to get there any quicker than that. We I'm need like, Star Trek style Yeah, so it's technology. not going to happen. So look, if we want definitive life off planet, we're going to have to look uh, at Mars and in places in our solar system, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think the take home message from this is that we have made extraordinary progress in being able to do detections on exoplanets, um, uh, such ranges. So that's the exciting thing. And let's sort of pour a little bit of cold water on the uh, on the you know teeming worlds of life forms, uh, although we do think they're probably out there. Yeah, watch this space, I think. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there for this uh, bonus episode. We're back tomorrow with another show, so do look out for us then. Alex Wilkins, thanks for your reporting on this. Uh, thanks to you for listening. Do tell your friends about our show. Give us a five-star rating and a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and subscribe on YouTube. Bye for now.